Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Zara and today I am very excited to announce that the first part of my interview with Tom Holt is now available. I met Tom last Sunday and my brother and I travelled down to the far south of England. I also live in the south of England but I live a little bit higher up than Tom and so my brother and I went out in the morning on Sunday and we had this really beautiful drive essentially across the English countryside and we got to meet Tom and his lovely wife Kim. It was an experience and it was one of those situations where you're always a little bit nervous to meet someone that you admire so much and I have to say this is one of those rare occasions where my expectations were not only met but they were exceeded. Tom is a very lovely individual, Kim is a lovely individual, they're both just so wonderful and I felt so welcome, my brother felt so welcome. We ended up spending about two, three hours there, which was a lot longer than we originally anticipated. So that just goes to show how lovely the experience was. I decided to split the interview up into two parts because we ended up talking for about two hours. I have edited out some parts where we veer off track a little bit just to keep it nice and concise and focused on his incredible writing and his writing and his inspirations, etc. What you are seeing is two parts of about 50 minutes long where we talk about all sorts of things. Some of these questions were from the questions that all of you lovely people asked, whether it was on Twitter, on my YouTube channel community tab, or on Discord. A lot of you folks asked a lot of the same questions. Some of the questions I even had myself, so I ended up just mishmashing them all together so that we could all get the answers that we so crave. The other thing that I will mention is that this was my first time doing an interview, so um, I'm, I'm hoping that it's educative for you guys. Uh, I was a little bit nervous, not necessarily about doing the interview because I've had to do a lot of interactions like that before, but more so that it was doing an interview with literally one of my favourite authors. But I, I think the end result is something that I am quite happy with. And honestly, it was just an honour and delight to meet Tom in person and to talk about all of his influences, given that there's literally nothing known about him on the internet. The other thing that I will mention is that the way that I set this up was that I have never obviously done an interview in person either, not in this format where you're asking someone questions and you're filming it. So uh, bear with me on doing these types of interviews. I'm hoping to do more in person. I just generally think it makes it a lot more personal. It makes it a lot more unique because a lot of the interviews that we see on YouTube tend to be via Zoom. Nothing wrong with that. I just feel like when you're in person, you can see the person's cues, you can see how they react to things a lot more organically and you can kind of see the space that we're in as well which can add a little bit of extra flavour to it but because this was my first time doing an interview like this the setting was a little bit different to what I'm typically used to. I do all my calls on Zoom generally so we kind of had to improvise a little bit when we got there with how we set everything up. I specifically did not want to be completely in frame so you'll you'll notice that that's why we set up the interview that way. I really wanted the focus to be on Tom because this is really his time to shine and really to tell us his story and talk about his incredible books. So I just wanted to flag that because you might be wondering why was Zara's face not present at all times? That's the reason why I really wanted him to be the focal point of this interview so that's why I did it like that. The last thing I will mention is that there are no spoilers in either of these interviews. I specifically made sure that we didn't talk about any spoilers. We do talk about some of his books. Tom is very open to doing a second interview with me, which I'm very excited about. And I think in that we will do much more of a deep dive on his individual books and series. So if you are new to KJ Parker, or if you've not read much of his stuff and you really don't want to go into it with any spoilers, don't worry. Uh, I purposely made sure that we didn't cover any spoilers so that you can watch this interview from beginning to end without any issues. So that's it for me, that's the little preamble done. We go straight into the interview. There was, we did chat a little bit before the actual interview kicked in, but I decided to cut that out just really mainly to, to kind of reduce the size of the file. I start the interview where it kind of officially starts and uh, I end the interview, or at least part one of the interview at a place where I thought made sense. And then part two will pick up straight from that. Obviously part one is coming out today, but then part two is going to come out next Friday as well. And I'm very excited for you to see both parts. Thanks for watching folks. And I really hope that you enjoyed this interview with Tom Holt, AKA KJ Parker. Enjoy. Firstly, I would love to learn more about your background. Mm -hmm. I'd love to learn more about you, you know, kind of how you got to writing, what's been the journey together? That, uh, that's a, a fairly straightforward, straightforward uh, 
question. Um, I, both my parents were um, uh, lo loved books, uh, and, and uh, they they met uh, they met at Cambridge uh, just uh, just after the war, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and got together uh, over the poetry of John Donne, which was uh, a good start to a yeah. to, to a married life. Uh, my mother uh, always wanted to uh, wanted to write. Um, though she only started, though she only uh, she, she she wrote detective stories, um, but only, but only started after after writing them after after I started writing, which was yeah. typical of her. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I, I, I started writing when I was uh, when I was a child. Had my 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 first book was published when I was twelve, which was a wow. which was a book of poetry and. Yeah. Uh, Looking back, I, it, that was it, that was a very bad start because it uh, um, I was uh, uh, I was a, a media sensation for about five minutes, being a, being a child prodigy, yeah. and um, it took me a long time to recover from that. Interesting. But uh, recover I did eventually. Um, yeah. My mother was all, uh, was also a, a very great uh, a very great friend of the novelist Barbara Pym, okay. uh, and uh, so. so I uh, I grew I, I grew up uh, uh, n uh, not so much uh, around uh, around writers because Barbara was the was the only writer we knew, yeah. but um, but being ve ve very aware of, uh, of 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 writers and publishers, and also because of the the, cir uh, the circumstance of Barbara Pym's story, um, she, as, uh, uh, as you probably know, she was she was mildly successful for a while, then. It, yeah. uh, she was dropped like a stone by um, uh, by, by all the publishers in, the, in this country, and and and, and only uh, came back into popularity a couple of years before her death. So uh, one uh, one lesson that I learned very early is yeah. that um, you can be really good at writing, and nobody nobody will want to know you. Yeah. Um, I got into writing myself uh, 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 because uh, in a, in a, uh, through. Sheer nepotism and intrigue. Uh, after Barbara died, my uh, my mother was appointed her literary executor, um, uh, which put her into contact with um, with uh, high powered editors who yeah. uh, on a, on, a, on first name terms. Yeah. Being my mother, she said uh, one of the first things she said to them was, "My son writes, you know," uh, uh, which meant that the uh, that the first six the, the first six chapters of the first novel I ever wrote were put down in front of a, a, a high powered editor. Yeah. Uh, who's, uh, who said yes? I like this. We would like to see, like to see some more of it. Uh, it took me about a year to write the first six chapters, and, uh, and about three weeks to write the second six oh chapters gosh. before before the, before they got away. Yeah. And uh, and that was my first novel, which was uh, and and, and, you, and um, you couldn't you simply couldn't ask for a, uh, for, for a better start than that. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's to that that I owe everything. Yeah. And uh, and uh, si since then, I, I, I've only ever had two manuscripts rejected, which um, wow. is. I'm really curious what those manuscripts are about now. One of them <laughs> uh, was was a, a Tom Holt comic fantasy novel, okay. and and, uh, and it really did deserve, deserve to be rejected. Okay. It was awful. Okay. I couldn't couldn't see it at the time, but but I shudder to think of it now. Okay. The second uh, was. Um, a K.J. Parker novel, Sharps, okay. not Sharps, um, Savages, okay. uh, which didn't turn out the, uh, the way my editor wa uh, wanted it. Um, and I, 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 I belong to the Captain Janeway school of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, 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 of revision. If I, uh, I don't allow the ship to be boarded, I, I, I prefer to blow it up first. Yeah. So I said, no, uh, fine, but if you don't like this one, I'll write you another one, which I did. Yeah. And then on an off chance, I offered Sharps to, um, oh, Sharps, Savages, Savages to, uh, yeah. to uh, the, the, uh, 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 a publisher in the, uh, in the States who, uh, who, who, published, who published a lot of my, my short stuff. And, uh, and he, uh, I said, give me $2,000 and you, you can have it. And he was, and he was very glad to. And, oh, nice. um, because it, was, it, it, it happens to be my favourite of all my books, so I wanted, I wanted to see, to yeah. see it. And I went on and uh, and and, uh, and and wrote the the, the series that the, the, that 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 my ink that my publisher little Brown wanted, and it, and, and it was it's turned out fine. So so no harm done to anybody. Yeah, exactly. 
but apart, apart from that touch wood, uh, uh, I've, um, I've, I've got away with it. So far. <laughs> so far, yeah. But... Many more to come, hopefully. How do you think Mum helped shape your writing? I mean, she was a writer herself. How did that help you adapt? She, uh, she, she was um, my first editor and the only, only editor I've ever listened to. Yeah. Um, and she, t uh, and she told me that, uh, in a, a nice, quiet, pleasant way, what was wrong with what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I learnt a lot of lessons without without realizing realizing I was learning. But say, uh, but um, my, my my father was a very good critic as well, and um, uh, and um, uh, from them I. Uh, I learned about pretty much the basics of of, yeah. of, of, of what of, of what I know now. Yeah. Do you think it was sometimes not great having your mum as your editor? No, no. Um, she, uh, it was it was the, it was the main thing we had in okay. common. I would, I would say. Yeah, so it unified the two of you. Yeah, and uh, uh, and uh, she was. Uh, I think uh, I think that she, that that that, uh, that she channeled her her, uh, her own ambition to write into me yeah. as typical of her yeah. uh, and it was I say it was it was it was only after I'd uh, I'd um, become established that she, that she gave it a go herself and, yeah. and very well she did too she uh, she's much more popular in America than she uh, in this country because she yeah. because she uh, she chose to write uh, cozy detective stories which yeah. was much more popular over there than they are here in, in fact she uh, she started uh, started me off in in uh, in, in writing generally, uh, consider, uh, considerably before that, because she got uh, when I was about uh, just after I'd, I'd had my book of poems published, she um, uh, got a job uh, as a reviewer for uh, for the stage, which is the um, the, th the theatrical trade yeah. paper, yeah. Uh, and she got a job as their television reviewer. Okay. And when she'd been doing that for a bit, she she said to the, the editor, "My son also writes, you know." And uh, and, so, and so at the age of about thirteen, I was I, I was re review, uh, uh, reviewing um, uh, television programmes for uh, uh, for a national newspaper. Nice. Uh, and, until the um, until the NUJ found out about it, you can't belong to the NUJ, uh, uh, and, and, or at least you couldn't at that time until um, uh, until, until you were eighteen. So, uh, so so I had I had to stop. Oh, what, how old were you at that point? About fourteen. Oh, okay. Uh, but I got I got my own back on the NU jokes. I, ma I married the daughter of the uh, of the, the, of the, pre of the president of the NU. That's a long way of being about yeah. it. <laughs> I love it. My mother was uh, my my main influence, um, yeah. uh, and uh, well, although we could, uh, the, the, the th things that the things that that she that she wrote and read couldn't be more different from what I, from yeah. what I do. Uh, but so that's probably that's, that's probably a good thing. There's definitely an element of mystery in quite a lot of your books, so maybe you got that from her, maybe <laughs> subconsciously. I got the idea, the the, the, the idea of, of the mystery plot yeah. for for a non-mystery book from uh, from J.K. Rowling. Okay. Because I, I realised that 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 was the key that was the key, the key ingredient in what in what made in what made her her. Her stuff so popular. Yeah. It's that she she she'd taken all the mechanism of, of of the detective story and used it in something that wasn't a detective that's story. That's so true. Yeah. Um, and I I, I I saw yeah that that's a very good way to go about things. I admire I admire her enormously as a craftsman. Yeah. Because uh, because I uh, because whenever when, always when I uh, when. When I read books, I, I I don't I can't I can't just stop at reading. I have to take them back off and see how they work. Yeah. And it's very rewarding doing that with with, with J.K. Rowling because, yeah. uh, because you can, she, she she has incorporated enormous numbers of mechanisms from a, a wide variety of genres, and uh, and has uh, and has, pick, uh, has picked up all sorts of things from uh, from. A very wide range of, of sources and influences, and brought them together in, yeah. into something which, which, in spite of or because of it, 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 it's made up of so many different ingredients, is actually original. Yeah, I feel like she's one of those authors that you can reread and reread because you always do. get something I do. new from her. Yeah, the, uh, uh, but uh, she, she's definitely someone to learn from. Yeah, uh, and you, you, you stop and think what. Well, 
here is somebody who, uh, who, who, who whose writing has appealed to more people than any, any other living yeah. person. This is obviously someone, you, someone to learn from. Yeah, 100%. I have to ask, which is your favourite Harry Potter book? <laughs> I don't curious. think I don't think of them as uh, I think of them as as, as, as all one Continuous, book. Continuous, yeah. Uh, Fair enough. Yeah, the, the, the divisions between them are purely arbitrary. I think. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think that's fair. What other authors have had an influence on you? And your writing style. Oh God, ever so many. Um, for example, I learned I learned most of what I know about writing in the first person from uh, H. Ryder Haggard, okay. um, who has a, a, ma a main narrator in, in most of his um, his his African romances, uh, who has who has the ability to uh, to comment on himself without knowing what he's doing. Okay. He, uh, and that I think is, 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 the, is the wonderful advantage that a first person narrator gives you. Yeah. That, you, uh, that, you, that, that you, can do, you can do complex characterization without having to work at it. You can, the, 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 in a first person narrative, the, 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 the narrator is, all, is constantly, unconsciously ca uh, yeah. uh, commenting on himself. Yeah. I, le uh, I learned uh, um, uh, uh, a huge amount about uh, use of language okay. from uh, from Damon Runyon, P. G. Woodhouse, and Ernest Brahma, yeah. because uh, uh, three uh, I, I regard them as writers of fantasy because, uh, because the world they described never existed and never could exist, right. um, and they and they invented uh, invented uh, languages and, and, and uses of language and linguistic mechanisms. Right. Uh, to, to make their fantasy world uh, seem seem like a real one. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, Damon Runyon's New York and, and, and New Yorkers are, are they're no relation to anybody who's 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 ever lived, yeah. but they are completely believable in their own terms. Okay. And the same goes goes for uh, for, for, uh, for, uh, for for Woodhouse's um, vision of, uh, of Edwardian England or or Farmer's version of China. Yeah. They're they're complete they're completely fictitious, but in their own terms. They're they're completely believable, and yeah. I thought that that's that, that's a really useful lesson for writing fantasy because yeah. in fantasy, obviously, you have you, by definition this is a world that never existed, never could exist. Yeah. Um, but so how do you how the hell do you go about making it believable? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I have to say, your books do feel like that. Your books feel very real, like they could be happening in the real world. It's the uh, I. I I didn't learn the lesson from Peter Jackson, but uh, but, 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 he, but he 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 sort of pr uh, proved me right yeah. that, the, that the way to make fantasy believable is to have little nuggets of of, uh, of absolute reality, like the the advertisers say, made with real uh, with with real chocolate when when it's sort of ninety percent uh, yeah. cellulose and ten yeah. percent chocolate. Yeah. If you make things with reality, yeah. then people think it's real. Yeah. And which which is why uh, uh, Peter Jackson has handmade bowls and 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 uh, 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 as props. Yeah. And you see the you, you see the wood grain and the tool marks on the handmade bowls. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and uh, and you and you you believe in the world that he's showing you. You and, and you can believe in the dragons and the goblins, because uh, because there there are real things in there. Yeah. I, I I've imported huge amounts of real history in uh, into what I write. Um, in, in the hope that it will kid people into believing if, if, if believing in the uh, the, t the two ing the two ingredients that, 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 that I, I, I really try to, to, to incorporate a real history and real people yeah. if you can if you have real if you have real people and things that real people have actually done i.e history yeah. then you, you, you're, you're a long way to, 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 to bridging the gap to making people believe in this totally imaginary Definitely. Uh, construct. Yeah, definitely. We'll get onto history in a, in a bit because I have quite a few questions <laughs> on that. Um, but one question that I have is because you mentioned kind of non typically non fantasy writers that have kind of inspired yeah. you. Are there any more traditionally based kind of fantasy writers that have inspired you? I mean, you mentioned Tolkien in the context of the movies, but did the writer himself? Also yes, uh, uh, it, 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 it was Tolkien who uh, who. Made me realise that uh, that, uh, that 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 fantasy was uh, a a genre which allowed you to do far more than any other conventional genre does. Um, 
you can uh, gave me idea gave me the idea of doing things with enormous scope. I've, I've read a lot of fantasy, but uh, but mo but most of what most of what I've learned from from it is what not to do. Yeah. What to avoid because it doesn't ring true. Right. I, for, uh, for a number of years, I, I, I had a gig uh, uh, review, reviewing for uh, for, a, uh, for, uh, for a science fiction and fantasy magazine, and I learned an awful lot about how not to write doing that, um, and, and, caught, and realized, uh, caught, caught myself doing a lot of things that that, that, that when other people did it, I realised didn't work. That was a, that was a, it was a very useful apprenticeship. Yeah, I can imagine. Can you give it like an example of something that you would catch yourself doing, and then you've stopped yourself quickly? Yeah. Um, well, uh, purple passages uh, of, of 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 lush descriptive prose. Yeah. Uh, which uh, which make it obvious that it, 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 it's someone making it making it up. Yeah. It's far it's far better to let details uh, leak out because right. the, uh, because things people mention in passing. Are convincing things people tell you about uh, uh, speaking straight to camera aren't, and when the narrator speaks straight to camera, then uh, uh, th th then you then then you are you're, you're practically being told this is all make believe. Yeah. The other thing that uh, that that um, uh, that I I I made a, a vow never to do well two things Dra first dragons I thought I'd, I'd never do dragons. Interesting. Um, okay. Uh, which which vow I, uh, I, I I broke shortly after, yeah. but, but only because I wanted to. See, I thought, I thought how, how how can I how can I do a dragon make people people actually believe that it's real? Yeah. So I wrote a short story about that. Yeah. Um, the, the, the the other thing I have to say, to say that that I um I I I made a vow not to do was uh, was um what I believe in is known in the trade as chicks and chainmail. I. Uh, it, uh, I, I, uh, in in my historical researches, yeah. I have come across I think seven documented ins instances of female warriors, yeah. as opposed to God knows how many million male ones. Yeah. It's what it, I think it's it, it's probably the conclusive argument for the superiority of the female sex that they don't fight it. They can yeah, fight it. they can help it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and the the feisty kick-ass heroine in Chainmail. Is is being so false to me that okay. uh, that, that 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 I do try and avoid her where I possibly can, which is why I, I uh, the book the uh, the the series I'm I, I I'm writing at the moment yeah. has got a central uh, a central yeah. feisty kick ass heroine within chain mail. Yeah, she's fantastic. Just because every 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 time I uh, I, I say I'm not going to do that because it's impossible. I, that, that, that resolves me to do it. Exactly. I love that you're doing that. I love that you did that with the dragon. You did yeah. that with the feisty woman in Chainmail. I do really like that. I don't know if you watched Rings of Power, but they they did that to Galadriel, <laughs> which was to many people's chagrin. I think it mostly started with Xena, Xena Warrior yes, Princess. I, he was yeah. one of the most unbelievable characters I've ever put on screen. Yeah, I loved I loved Zena. <laughs> I, yeah. I grew up with Zena, so, so yeah, my, so did my daughter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, uh, but my, my, once you, uh, you, you you appreciate that that like like dragons, she is purely a creature of fantasy. Uh, yeah. Then you, that, that, then you can you can enjoy her as such. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, that, but but that's not that but it's not that's not the sort of fantasy that, that I'm capable. Uh, uh, I would like to be able to write that sort of thing, but I, but I, 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 I couldn't do it well because I don't believe in it myself. Yeah, that's fair enough. It's always good to write what you believe in, right? It's if, uh, even if you don't agree with it. Oh, um, it's uh, um, it's not it's not a case of what I want to do. It's what it's what a case of, uh, a case of uh, of what I know I'm capable of. Yeah. Um, it's one of the reasons why there are, why there aren't many strong female characters in in, in yeah. my books because guess what I'm not female. I, yeah. I, I, uh, my, my my characters are um, almost exclusively me. If I come to a point where I've got to figure out someone's motivation, it's the question is what would I do if I was this person? Yeah. And this so so that so uh, uh, who are the characters in, in in my books based on? They're based on me, all of them. Yeah. Um, I, so it, it, it's harder for me to think into a female mind because I haven't got one. Yeah. The, uh, it's uh, I, it's much easier for me to have a male character reacting to female to, to, to female characters because I 
I can do that. Yeah. But I, I wouldn't presume to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to try and put myself into a female mind. It's too, too difficult for me. There are lots, of, there are lots and lots of, sort of sorts of writing that I know I can't do, yeah. so I don't. As a reader, I really appreciate that because I've read books written by male authors where they're trying to do the female voice mm. and you can just tell that it's... I don't know, it's just a load of mishmash mm. nonsense. <laughs> or indeed the way Jane Austen writes men as if she'd never met one. Do you like Jane Austen? Do you like I her do. writing? <laughs> I do, I do. Uh, um, my mother adored Jane Austen yeah. and, and, and held her up as the, as, uh, as, as the model of, of, of how a novel should be written. Yeah. I, don't actually, uh, I, I don't actually agree, but, uh, but um, uh, I, I, I think she is a technician of language, not a great technician of story. Mind you, she does write wonderful screenplays. The, sa the same with Dickens. Dickens, yeah. uh, Dick, uh, Dickens writes wonderful screenplays, yeah. but um, they... But they uh, 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 it can be quite hard to get through sometimes. <laughs> it took it, it, it took it took me it took me a while because uh, yeah. uh, because Dickens does 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 love to get up in his pulpit and preach, okay. uh, right in the middle of the narrative flow. He 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 he, is, he here's a wonderful writer to learn from because of his ability to send different di different sort of routes of of, uh, of, 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 of of storytelling off in all sorts of different directions. Yeah, that made me want to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to to to. Have a go at that. So, uh, so, so I, 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 I wrote a, uh, a set of books called *The Two of Swords*, um, which, uh, uh, which, which were, were, was de designed to be written in, in serialisation, right. uh, the, the way that Dickens wrote. Right. And, uh, uh, and uh, I set off on that as, as a sort of adventure, not knowing where the hell it was going to go. And I'm quite pleased with the outcome. Yeah. But, it, but, but that, that would ne I'd never have thought, thought of writing a book like that. If, if my publisher hadn't said, "Hey, how would it be if we if we if we wrote one that we, we, we could publish online online in installments?" Yeah, definitely. I'm I haven't read Two of Swords yet. I have all the books, <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to getting to it this year. But I did find it really because when I searched for the books online, it did show up as the individual like volumes, mm. and I was very confused. And then I realised that they had been bundled up yeah. into three books. And yes, the, like, exper okay. the experiment didn't actually work. Yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but the but there was I, I'm, I'm quite pleased with the result. It's it's it's, uh, it's, it's got a nice central character. Yeah. Um, who. Uh, only emerged as a central character about halfway through because I, I yeah. like writing about him more than anybody else. Oh, interesting. Okay, I can't wait to read it now. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll start there next. We've talked about a couple of your favourite authors and influ authors hmm. that have influenced you. What about? You know, maybe your top three favourite books of all time. What are three books that you've enjoyed and you can reread over and over again? If you account for, uh, the, 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 the three volumes of one book, the book the, the, the book that I read at least once a year is John Julius Norwich's History of Byzantium. Okay, interesting. Uh, which it's not actually a work of fiction because there are the bits of it are actually accurate. Yeah. Uh, he's not. He, he's not a very good historian, but he's a, mar a, a mar he's a marvelous storyteller. Yeah. And the story of of of, of, uh, of the Byzantine Empire is is uh, the greatest story ever told. Yeah. But that's the one thing that's inspired inspired me more than anything else. It's it, it's the uh, the the incredible vicissitudes of uh, and, and, and the amazing characters that uh, and of, and of course it is. Well, it certainly is uh, certainly is true as anything you read in the newspaper. I won't say it's, it's actually true, yeah. but the, the, the outlines of it are true. And uh, and I've I've drawn Lord knows how many um, uh, characters and storylines from it. Oh, I have to read it now. <laughs> I have to try and find <laughs> which characters are which. <laughs> there, there was there, there, uh, there was the, the story. The Emperor Michael the Fourth um, is, the, I think, the, is the most moving story I've ever read in my, really? uh, come across in my life. Um, Michael started off. Um, there, there, there were three peasant brothers in in, in Cappadocia, yeah. um, and uh, the uh, the eldest brother went uh, managed to uh, be recruited as a uh, to be trained as a scribe in the uh, uh, in the imperial court. He 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 grew, he grew to be a very important government official, and so he sent for his other two brothers. Yeah. The middle brother, Michael, was uh, was incredibly good looking, and the at the at the time. Uh, the ruler of Byzantium, Byzantium was the Empress Zoe, who was um, uh, 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 who, who, uh, who became Empress at the age of about fifty. She was ravishing beauty in her youth. Yeah. They, they had married her off, to, off to a son to the hope that he was the son, uh, but it was a bit late by then. The, 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 the elder brother thought 
if I if I introduced my stunningly good good looking brother to uh, to the Emperor Zoe, yeah. um, uh, then they, they they can murder the Emperor, and my and, and my brother can take his place. Yeah. And this duly happened. Yeah. Immediately, as soon uh, as soon as he was on the phone, uh, the first thing um, Michael did was uh, was was have was have Zoe locked up. The second thing he did was was to execute his brother. Oh. And the third, and the third thing he did was was to was to was to, was to try and uh, uh, to was take a good look at the empire and try and figure out how to run, how to run it to make it yeah. to make life better for people. Yeah. He actually he he, he 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 tried to provide welfare for the poor. Yeah. Um, and the uh, and he carried he 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 did his, the very best he could do to try to try and to try and be a good emperor and redeem himself in the eyes of God. Uh, so what what happens? He gets dropsy. And, he's, and, and he is transformed from the most handsome man in the empire into a sort of misshapen, swollen lump, yeah. which is sort of answers his question very nicely: Are you forgiven? No. Yeah. Um, and then the empire, the empire was invaded by uh, Bulgarian nomads, um, and they were in, uh, uh, and in, in grave danger of Constantinople falling. Michael, who had never been on campaign in his life and was by this stage incapable of movement. Said, I will lead the army um, myself, okay. and he and he led the army, and uh, and they won. And and, and the and um, uh, by the time Michael Michael got back, he was he, he was dying. So he so he had his body he had himself carried to a monastery, and there he died, having having um, put on monastic uh, monastic robes and, and put away his crown. Yeah. I think that's the most moving story yeah, you could possibly imagine because it, it, it's somebody who. Was uh, who deliberate who deliberately committed all the sins you can think of, on the understanding that he could then repent, yeah. and he tries to repent, and uh, and it doesn't work, yeah. and eventually, at the very end, he is given the, uh, the chance to redeem himself, and he does, and he yeah. is forgiven, and it's a beautiful yeah, story. Yeah, it's a beautiful story. I need to read this one. This is did this also act as an influence for one of your stories? Yeah, I, I, I wrote a, no, uh, a novella try, uh, about about my, my yeah because it rang true because I read. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. I didn't get anywhere near the uh, the, the, the story, but it's, 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 it's a lovely story. Yeah, I'll definitely have to pick up that book. I'm mm. fascinated now. Mm. Are there any other books as well that had an influence on you? Loads, um, across an enormously wide range. For example, the, um, I don't know if you remember, uh, you're probably too young to remember, there was a television series called Love Joy about Cook and Antique Deal. Yeah, before, yeah, yeah. <laughs> before my uh, They were based in a series of novels written by a man called Jonathan Gash. Okay. He wrote in a, a first person narrative and he had them ha had a knack of making the unsympathetic actions of an unsympathetic character sympathetic. I, and and uh, I've never see, really seen that done before. And it, uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's a very, very rare thing to be able to pull off. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I learned an awful lot from that because a large proportion of, uh, yeah. of my narrators could be very unsympathetic if, uh, if, yeah. if, they, were, if, if they weren't fixed. And hopefully, touch wood, I can get that. I, I, the, the, the book that I, that I, that I sent you, um, uh, my editor had very grave grave doubts about whether whether anybody could uh, would want to be in the same room as uh, as the as, as Silas Corax and so I had, we had I had to pull out all the stops to try and make yeah. make him cuddly. I loved Corax. <laughs> <laughs> I think I said that to you in my email. I, I adore Basso. Mm -hmm. Basso is a character that I still think about very often. Um, I and I'd love to learn uh, more I about that. He, 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 I think he's the best character that, 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 that I've managed so far. Interesting. Um, he was. Uh, uh, I saw a picture of a, a, a bust of the Emperor Car Caracalla. Yeah. Um, and I, I saw that, and, and immediately, as soon as I, uh, 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 I, I, I knew who Basso was going to be. Yeah. He was, it was all in that, but all in the bust. That's fascinating. Um, and uh, and, and uh, I, knew, I, I then knew him as if I'd known him all my life. Interesting. From looking from from looking at him, I figured out I, I was able to figure out who he was and how he came to be that way. That's so fascinating. Does that happen often, or was that just no, kind of that specific was, to Basso? That, that, that was that was pure luck. I think that's okay. probably why he's such a, a, a sharply defined character. Yeah. Because uh, because he was given to me all in one piece. Yeah. Usually when I'm uh, uh, with a character, I, um, I start I start I start off with with a little hook of an idea. Uh, like the, like the com in 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 the company um, for years and years I've uh, I, I've had this mental image of a man uh, walking walk, walking up to a gate and uh, 
and saying hello to his old army buddy he hadn't yeah. seen for 20 years. That's all I had. But I thought that's that's a good that's a good hook. Uh, they haven't seen each other for all these these years, and they were in the army together. And now A wants B to do something for him. And and I had and, and then I worked backwards from that uh, to build the characters. Yeah. And uh, once I've once I've got two uh, two characters, then I could start to build a plot around them. Right. That, this is the order, I, uh, generally speaking, that I do things in. A little hook, and then, ca and then the then main characters, then a plot, and then I, I audition for the minor characters mm -hmm. to see to see who's going to be, who can help the plot along. Yeah, but going back to your previous point around Korax not being very likeable, mm. I think a lot of your characters are quite unlikable characters. Mm. I mean, Knesson, to this day, is yeah. probably still one of the most disturbing individuals <laughs> that I've ever read, and I mean that as a compliment, by the way, because I read a lot of dark fantasy, I read, I read a lot of dark books, so when I read that book, I really had kind of zero expectation going mm. into it as to how Knesset was going to be, and I remember like, by the end of it, because I was reading it with a friend of mine, by the end of it, I had to go watch something funny, because I just felt so sad, <laughs> it was hilarious. What is it about, because all of your characters, I, I feel like, have an element of that, I think Korax is the same, mm. he's very unlikable, but then he has this very cutting humour that just seems very relatable. You know, how do you make these characters so relatable as well? The the jokes help. That that yeah. uh, that, that, that it's, it's it's hard not to it, uh, to feel some degree of of sympathy for uh, for, for somebody with a sense of humour. Yeah. Um, I think think uh, think of how Shakespeare makes Richard the Third empathetic if not sympathetic it's something you, you immediately connect to it's, it's it's because he takes you into his confidence so if you write in the first person you're uh, uh, you're and, and if you if you write in the first person with 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 a, with a lively with a lively style and some jokes then the reader will, pro will probably give you the benefit of the doubt and read and, uh, and read on even though they don't like the person yeah, very much true. um I took I took a big risk with with Cybus. He features in, in in three books, and and, and the uh, and the the series is about is is about his redemption. So he starts off uh, not particularly nice, and he yeah. gets and he gets nicer. Yeah. I, I had a, a, a severe panic attack uh, um, about halfway through and thought, no, we've got we've, we've got to start with book two because he's nicer in book two. Uh, yeah. But my my my, my, my editor said, uh, said no, we'll um we'll 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 leave the order as it is. Yeah. Uh, if, if you want to see the other, uh, have a look at the other two, but I can send them to you because they're because they, they are finished. I read the first one very very quickly. I mean, mm. normally it takes me on average because I work and mm. life's busy. It takes me about a week, maybe four to five days mm. to finish a book. I read that in about two days. <laughs> <laughs> I was hooked. It was I'm, so good. <laughs> I'm very pleased you're the first person to have seen it outside. Yeah, I'm honoured. The, um, honestly, I'm honoured. Thank you so but much. I'd, I'd be interested to sit. Uh, to see if you think that I, that I have actually managed to get Make to, to it nicer. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're, you're releasing that at the end of this year, right? October, November and December, I think it is? Could or, well be. I, I, yeah, I, I saw... I lose track. Because you haven't done that before, I don't think. I think there's always been a wider gap between your tr your series. Mm. Is that... What was the kind of motivation to release it kind of month after month? Or was that more your agent and your... That, that, uh, that's my, my editor's editor, decision. Yeah. And, um, and he knows far more about these things than I do, so I'm... Yeah. I trust him implicitly. Yeah, fair enough. Even when he's wrong. So that's, <laughs> all, so that's all right. At least you can have those conversations. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of characters, what's a character, I'm going to ask both within your world, that mm. kind of really sticks out for you personally. I mean, you mentioned Basso, but whether there's any others. But then also just in fiction in general, what's a character that you've really identified with and it really resonates with you? Uh, it's because of the, of, of, the, of the way I read books, what I like about uh, what makes a character really attractive to me is is not the character the character per se, but the way in which the character is realised, right. the, the the mechanism. Right. Um, for, for example, the one of the most vivid characters and, and, and one who I've known all my life is um, by the Haggard's Alan Quatermain. Okay. Um, and the, it, uh, and the reason why the, that character works so well for me is is because. It, uh, you have a character who, uh, who who says one thing, who's, who's constantly saying one thing and thinking another. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, he, he is he is a, he, he is a white man in South in in South Africa in the nineteenth century. Right. He is he is he is writing for other white men. So uh, right. so he makes himself so, uh, take a a, a patronising imper uh, imperialist view yeah. of the Zulus and the Hottentots around him. Yeah. 
but you can but but the way he's written you can tell that he, that that he admires these people much more than he admires his own his own race Interesting. and it's it, it's an amazing it, it, it's a wonderful piece of writing particularly for its for its period that uh, that that uh, and, and amazing that that that, that Hagen wanted to do it and and was and got away with doing it right. the uh, the the heroes of his of, of his books are, are, are Zulu warriors uh, uh, and Hottentot servants. Okay. They, are, they, are, they are truly heroic characters. Yeah. The, uh, the, the white heroes and heroines are ciphers, uh, and, uh, and and that, and it's all it's all possible because of, uh, of of the way that Haggard uses Quatermain. Um, as 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 a, as a two voiced narrator, yeah. what uh, what he's saying and, and what he's thinking, and, it, 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 uh, and uh, therefore uh, as a character, that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, when you say who's your favourite character in literature, yeah. I, I I immediately think of Alan Quatermain because uh, because he, he he is such a wonderful mechanism. Yeah. You've added more books to my reading list. <laughs> I'm sure there's going to be more as well. Are there any characters that are written well, but that you really dislike? Because as we've said, a lot of your characters are very unlikable characters, but yet they still resonate, right? Because there's an element, at least for me, I don't know what that says about me, that kind of really resonates with me personally. Are there any characters that you found to be very unlikable, but they still feel real to you? No, not really, because... Uh, 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 uh. Uh, so, so long as a, uh, uh, as a character is believable yeah. and is uh, and is true to life, then uh, it's a good character. Yeah, I um, but, uh, if, if you ask me uh, who, uh, for, for my my favourite character in uh, in literature, the, uh, the, uh, as a as a character not that not, not not only is 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 well written but who, who I, I actually like a lot, would probably be Lord Peter Whimsey. Okay, again a. a, a, a Character written, obviously written as, uh, 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 as, as a wish fulfillment character, yeah. um, but so beautifully drawn and so beautifully realised mm -hmm. that uh, that although it's it, it's obviously a he's obviously a fantasy construct, yeah. he's also real yeah. and, uh, and so, uh, uh, re real enough that, that, that you can you, you, that you can sympathise with him and hurt with him yeah. uh, when, when he's being vulnerable, which he is a lot of the time. But, who, but who, who's also got, got this wonderful facade of, in, uh, of intelligence and wit, which which ought to be off-putting. He, he, he ought to, he ought to come across as a complete smartass, but he doesn't. Yeah, that's a, a, a very neat trick if you can do it. And uh, and and, uh, uh, and Dorothy Sayers could. And it, it's a marvelously drawn character. Yeah. Again, it's the mecha it's it's the it's the ways in which she stops him being a smartass. That, uh, that, uh, that 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 particularly attra attract me to the character. It's the, it's the way she moderates him and make and and keep and keeps him real and vulnerable. Yeah, I think a big part of that is how self-aware your characters are. Because mm. I think one of the things that I love about your characters and some of my other favorite fantasy authors and just authors in general is that the character may come across as a smart ass, mm. but they know that they're behaving like that to achieve a certain goal, yeah. or they're portraying that way of being just to. Mm you know, do a certain thing. And then you hear their reflection on that after the fact, and it kind of yeah. makes them feel very you know, unfiltered, mm. very kind of relatable. Cause I feel like a lot of people do that. You know, they put a hat on when they're going to yeah. do a specific task. So yeah. it feels very realistic to me. Mm. Yes, uh, Cyrus is, is, is particularly uh, like that. Uh, yeah. he, uh, but he is, put, he, he is continually put in situations where he has to be manipulating people, which right. he doesn't really like doing. Um, but he, but he, ha but he, he uh, he has to do it because it, it's constantly the lesser of two or three or fifteen different evils, yeah. and that uh, that made him an, inter uh, an interesting character because he 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 is someone who spends his entire life doing things he'd rather not do. Yeah. Uh, so the, ca uh, the character I'm writing at the moment um, uh, uh, is someone who, uh, uh, someone who yearns for a quiet life, but uh, yeah. uh, but. Uh, uh, is partnered with 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 somebody who is continually get, getting into the most appalling appalling scrapes. Yeah. yeah, definitely. A follow-on question that I have with that is, what what do you think? Apart from the kind of relatability aspect of it, what do you think makes a really compelling character? Just not not necessarily within your own writing, but just in general. 
I don't know. Uh, for me, it's uh, assuming that the character character is, is properly realised and is believable. Yeah. Um, no, I, 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 there, there isn't a common denominator to it. Because, uh, just there isn't a common denominator to people. Yeah, uh, it, 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 I guess that, I guess that character has to be has to be the right person in the right place. Yeah. The, um, the, 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 that that it. it I guess what what makes a, a, a character compelling is context. Yeah. That 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 that, it, that that character is 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 the right person is is the right person to be in at that time in that place doing that particular yeah. thing. That's what makes them interesting and compelling. Yeah, I agree. Would you ever write a kind of traditionally heroic character? I only in a very left-handed way. Okay. Um, it would uh, it would have to be, it would have to be somebody d uh, doing all manner of heroic things, very much very much against their will. Right. Um, and right. For, uh, uh, and uh, and for very particular motives. Yeah. Which were not heroic motives. Yeah. I hope you never do, because <laughs> I love your character. If, if it goes on the list of things that things that I mustn't do, obviously I'll have to do it. Yeah. Um, it is possible to do um, a convincing and fully realised, a hundred percent hero, uh, bec uh, because Wagner did it in Siegfried. Okay. Siegfried is uh, is the perfect hero, he, uh, and Siegfried works as a hero bec uh, because, as well as as well uh, as well as being a hero, he, uh, he, he's a fool. Yeah. Um, he he he's he he, uh, he is perfectly He's a perfectly characterised seventeen-year-old. Right. And once once you realise that he's seventeen years old, everything else falls into place, and he's a totally believable character. Yeah. Um. So it is possible. It is, yes, it's possible to do a, a a real hero. It doesn't happen very often. Yeah. yeah it's uh, because heroes happen, but don't happen very often. Yeah, exactly. And if, and and you uh, and in order to make to make uh, to make Siegfried believable, you have to have all the, all the rest of the apparatus, the the, the enormous uh, sort of, uh, uh, funnel of backstory that funnels down into into the creation of this character. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Siegfried without the backstory uh, uh, would just be a thug. Exactly. When you're when you're writing your characters, how do you? I mean, you mentioned that it's a part of you. Know, your characters are a part of you, right? Mm. How do you get into their heads, though? Because, you know, when you're doing a basso, he has some similar characteristics to, say, like a Knesson, mm. but they're, they're very different personality-wise. How do you, you know, when you were writing Knesson, as it was on, how did you get into his head, into his psyche? By thinking, if I was in this mess, what would I do? Okay. And so, the, the, same, the, the same goes for, uh, for, uh, for, for, uh, for pretty much every character I, I write. It's uh, the... the the reason I, the reason I am not like those people is because I'm not in that situation. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, because I feel I feel like when I read your books, I think you know what horrific things are they doing? But to your point, if I was in that situation, would I actually do them any differently? I don't know if I would. The, not the, to that the, extreme necessarily. Yeah, I don't think I'm that. <laughs> the, um, uh, the, the, the only character I, I, I ever had moments doubt about was in the in, in the first uh, books I wrote the. Um, Character of Bardas um, where, um in the uh, the bit where he makes a bow out of his uh, his, uh, his his nephew, okay. which was quite an extreme thing to do. But yeah. it, uh, 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 and, I, uh, and uh, uh, a reviewer said that was that, that was the most nauseating and sickening scene she'd ever read. And I, I, I valued that. I, yeah. I, it made me feel very proud. Yeah. Um, I, I could actually see at that stage see Barnes doing it, but I'm not quite sure I could do, uh, that, that I would have done it. Yeah, Other than that, yeah. they are they're, they're basically reacting. Uh, I'm basically try, trying uh, tr drawing on my own experience of you uh, to, th to think how what would what would what what would you do under those circumstances? Yeah, exactly. yeah. And since the only person I uh, I can speak for is myself, I can. That's where I have to draw from. Yeah, 100%. And there we have it, folks. That's the end of the interview. I really hope you enjoyed part one. Let me know if you have any comments. I'd love to hear what you thought about some of the stuff that he said down below in the comments. If you like this interview, please give it a thumbs up. It really does help. 
and I really want as many people to see this interview as much as possible because Tom deserves the visibility and I really hope we can get the word out. Thanks for watching again, stay safe as always, take care and I'll see you in part two. Bye.